Seagate will soon release their new hammer-enabled Exos Mosaic 3 Plus drives for general availability. They will provide the next step in capacity and continue to enable the drop-in per terabyte pricing for long-term mass storage. So in this video, I'm going to explore the engineering and the physics involved in this evolution in drive technology. Current hard drive use technologies such as PMR for perpendicular magnetic recording and TDMR for two-dimensional magnetic recording and this is to optimize data write density as well as packing in tracks closer together and reducing the size of the magnetic domains that hold each bit. Overall disk density has also been improved by adding more platters. Unfortunately, all of these are running into limitations both in terms of the physical room to add platters and the physics of the magnetic domain stability as they get smaller. Adding more platters which was enabled with helium fill allowed platters to run closer together with less resistance and turbulence and the largest drives currently have 10 platters but 10 platters and 20 read write heads in a form factor of less than one inch doesn't allow much room for expansion and when it comes to the size of the magnetic domains what is the barrier there let's go deep into that problem and then go deep into how new drives are enabling advances in aerial density by looking at the engineering challenges the technology and even the physics that are involved in solving this it's really interesting so bits of data, e.g. a 1 or a 0, each use a magnetic domain on the disk and this is physically a set of grains which are made of a ferromagnetic alloy containing materials such as iron or cobalt and this is sprayed on the surface of the disk platter which are then polarised to represent the 1 or the 0. So the size of each domain has shrunk over time but each is currently less than 30 nanometers long or that's around 0.00003 millimetres and in current 20 terabyte disk the track width is creeping below 50 nanometers as wide as well so this is really small and hard disk heads have to locate this precise area when reading or writing and to give you a sense of scale a single iron or cobalt atom is around a quarter of a nanometer across so these drives really do operate at the nanoscale Okay, now we know what a physical bit looks like on the disk, let's talk about how the data is stored in it. The right head will create a magnetic flux as it passes over the magnetic domain for that bit on the disk and set the polarity of all of these grains. It's important that enough grains are polarized so that the magnetic polarity is unambiguous and can be retained long term. External effects such as cosmic rays and rights to neighboring domains can potentially alter the polarity of these grains. And if enough are changed that the overall polarity has changed or it just becomes too weak to read, then the data in the domain is lost and this is fundamentally what bit rot is, e.g. the passive loss of data on the disk. The difference between hard disk drives and SSD based disks is that the way the data is stored on a hard disk doesn't degrade on its own and can notionally be stored indefinitely. So it's external factors that have to change the data for it to degrade. So density is what drives capacity in hard disks because the physical form factor is set by standards. So let's explore the challenges with increased density. So the obvious way to achieve this is to reduce the physical space required by each bit. To retain the signal to noise ratio, the number of grains stored in each bit cannot easily be reduced, so the size of the grains needs to be reduced. But with this reduction, we increase the risk of data being lost a bit rot because smaller grains mean each grain has a higher chance of flipping its polarity. So a solution to this is to make the grains more resilient to external factors and thus make the polarity more resilient in each grain, reducing the possibility of data decay. And this is the path that leads leads us to hammer or heat assisted magnetic recording. One way to make the data more resilient is to increase the coercivity of the grains. This term simply refers to how hard it is to change the magnetic polarity of the field in the material. The higher the coercivity, the harder it is to change the polarity and the more resilient the data is. This property is mostly affected by anisotropic properties of the material, namely how aligned the magnetic orientation of the particles remains over time. If the magnetic anisotropy of the material is high, it's harder to change the polarity and reduces the chance of bit rot. But the problem to be solved here is that if the coercivity is high, then the magnetic field needed in the right head to write data gets in practically large. And, and this is where Pierre Curie, husband of Mary Curie, rides in to help us. He identified that certain materials lose their permanent magnetic properties at a certain temperature, the Curie point. So how coercive a material is changes at high temperatures. So a material can be chosen that has a high coercivity at below 100 Celsius, for example, and it's hard to change the magnetic polarity. And this is known as a hard magnet, but has a low coercivity at a high temperature, let's say 400 degrees centigrade, where it's easy to change the polarity. And this is a soft magnet. In PMR, 
car discs produced over the last decade or more, materials like cobalt platinum alloys are used for the magnetic medium and these, though less magnetically stable, can be written to at lower temperatures with easy to manage magnetic fields. And these are fine if you say have 50 to 100 nanometers of these grains in the magnetic domain. But when you get below 25 nanometers, stability becomes more of a factor and current 20 terabyte plus PMR drives are around 1.2 gigabit per square inch and around 50 nanometer by 30 nanometer for a bit of data. So the capacity of current cobalt platinum coated drives is nearing its maximum, short of finding a way to cram in more platters or possibly finding a little more wiggle room in the track width, hence why SMR was pursued. Top end drives have 10 platters today, so with 20 recording surfaces, it's already a feat to fit these into the one inch or 26 millimeter high chassis of the hard disk. However, more stable materials like iron platinum alloys are available which are far more magnetically stable, but it's hard to write at normal operating temperatures, so the material needs to be heated so that it can be written with a typical write head. So that's a lot of detail and don't worry if it doesn't make all sense because put simply what it means is that you can use a material on a disc which is very resilient to bit rot at normal operating temperatures but can be easily written to at high temperatures. This means you can safely use a smaller surface area to store one bit because this area will maintain its state more reliably given greater aerial density and this means better data density and ultimately higher capacity discs. And this is where hammer or heat assisted magnetic recording comes in. The heads heat the very precise area of the disc that the drive wants to write to for an extremely short time. And it's actually around one nanosecond for the entire heat write cool cycle. Once that bit is cooled, it's going to be very resilient to passive data loss or to influence when neighboring portions of the disc are written to. So that sounds fine, uh, but I'm sure you guessed it creates new challenges that need to be solved. And they need to be solved in a way that maintains the same level of reliability of the drive, which for the new Seagate Enterprise drives that have this technology, it's around two and a half million hours MTBF, which is an analyzed failure rate of around 0.35%, meaning that any given disk should have a statistical likelihood of a failure in any given year of only around one in 300. And you can check out other videos if you want to learn more about AFR, how it works, what the published AFR rates for common drives and what the real life numbers typically are. And spoiler, for many disk manufacturers, they are not actually what they say they will be, but they are in the same magnitude. And I wanna say this video isn't about Seagate, though they do have the first product to market. Toshiba and Western Digital have been pursuing an alternate approach known as MAMA or microwave assisted magnetic recording. But this approach, though simpler, isn't likely to have the same impact to capacity. And those manufacturers are also pursuing hammer technology as well. So this is more about how the technology works in general. And I think the challenges here and the solutions are what make this technology really interesting. And I'm sure there will be lots of comments about how this is likely to cause reliability or other issues, but I'm not gonna get into that as there isn't really a good data source to look at but Seagate offer the same failure predictions and warranty on these products as their others, and they say that reliability has exceeded their expectations significantly, claiming that single head reliability was actually in far excess of typical use at around two petabytes of data transfer. They've also been shipping these products to cloud scale customers for quite some time now for real world validation, and they do claim to have millions of test hours under their belts. So for now, let's just put that to one side. Let's focus on the key challenges and how they're solved. And these are materials, accurate heat applications to the recording surface and management of that heat. So we learned that heat is what used to facilitate writing of the data to the disk, changing the magnetic polarity of the domain that stores each bit. So using the new high anisotropy iron platinum media to record the data, that portion has to be heated to a temperature that this can happen. And this needs to be done quickly and precisely as heating surrounding areas could mean that those areas could be affected by the right operation also overrating that data. The platters have to be coated in a way that reduces heat dispersion and the application of heat has to be precise and minimal. And to do this, the disc has to have insulating layers containing the heat to the target areas. And it also needs to have a different top coat lubricant layer that can withstand that heat. And this brings us to the second and much more challenging problem. And this is that the heat has to be applied very accurately. So to do this, the technology uses a laser to heat the area to be written to just before the write operation. But Lasers typically have a wavelength of between 180 nanometers and 400 nanometers for ultraviolet wavelengths, and then from about 400 to 700 nanometers for the visible ranges. So for example, Blu-ray lasers are around 402 nanometers. Unfortunately, there is a problem with focusing a laser down to more than around half its wavelength, and this is known as the diffraction limit. For example, a Blu-ray laser can only be focused down to around 238 nanometers, and this means the laser cannot be focused to an area of 30 by 30 nanometers, and this is 
choose the area that is needed to really get the density that's desired. So to achieve this, the laser isn't actually fired at the disk surface itself, but at a waveguide and into a component called a plasmonic near field transducer, or NFT for short. So at this point, things are going to get a little bit physics. So I'll try to explain this in a simple way as possible. So when the light hits the NFT, which is a gold disk, it displaces the electrons on the metal and it creates an electromagnetic field called a surface plasmon. And this is a near field effect, meaning that the electromagnetic field stays on the surface of the gold disk and just travels across its surface. And interestingly, the surface plasmon effect is actually the same effect that causes stained glass to have its color. And this is when metals are mixed with the glass. See, the NFT is a disk shape and then it has a small protrusion at its base, which is called the peg. The heating effect of these fields is actually conducted into the media based on the shape of this peg. So a small peg of around 30 nanometer square can transfer the heat into the media and heat an area that same size, much smaller than the spot that would be possible to focus a laser on. And this is how the accurate heating problem was solved and how Hammer achieves its storage densities. And because the heat is applied to a very small area, despite the high temperatures, the laser actually only needs to be about 0.2 watts. So it's actually only a small portion of the power draw and heat generation of the drive as a whole. So many of us have heard of Hammer and how it will allow these greater densities in discs and and Seagate have been shipping to validation customers for a couple of years, and currently you have a 30 terabyte CMR Exos disk using this technology, which they call the Mosaic 3 Plus. They expect to have a 50 terabyte disk by around 2028, and when combined with other upcoming technologies such as bit pattern media, capacities of 100 terabyte plus are expected around the early 2030s. So although the disks are not generally available yet, Seagate's website now has the product listed with model numbers and marketing material, so it probably won't be long until they're available, and when they are, you will know what goes on inside these discs, which I personally found fascinating. It is said that the price points will be in the same region as prior drives, at least on a per terabyte basis. So thanks for watching. Please do like this if it was interesting and sub for more technical content. And also do get into the conversation in the comments below your thoughts on this and the future of storage. And I will see you in the next.